But when his father saw him coming in the distance, the father did not wait. He called his servants and said, That's my son coming. Bring me my best clothes. And he ran and met his son. And before the son could even rehearse, let's say what he had rehearsed, I've seen against you, I've seen, he said, Hey, my son, you're welcome. Atu, Mafiwo, Kweku, Akwaba. And he took him in. He says, Hey, you see that big cow I was, I was keeping for Christmas? Bring it, bring it. Come and slaughter it. Let there be a feast. Let us enjoy. And so he took out the fattened calf. They cooked it. Everybody was enjoying. So that's the two personalities the father, the son. But there was another son, remember. And that son had stayed with the father, he had worked for the father. And at this stage, when the brother came back, he had gone to the farm, working. And so when he was coming back home, he heard music and people enjoying. And he said, ah, what is happening in the house? So outside, he called the servant and said, what is happening? He said, oh, that your younger brother, the one who took his share and went, he has come back home. And your father has killed a big cow for him and they are enjoying. So what happened? He got angry and said he would not go into the house until his father came out and came and asked him why and he said look i've been with you i've worked for you i have not been a, 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 a troublesome son i've done everything that a son should do for a father but you've never even killed one goat for me a punchy self abomin and then this my brother who took his share and went and wasted it he comes and you're killing a whole cow for him and of course you remember what the father said he said your brother was dead but now he's alive and that that your brother was lost and now is found and so it teaches us a lot of lessons one the lesson of tolerance to have tolerance for our families as fathers you must be tolerant it's good to be firm as a father but you must also be tolerant and loving to your children it also teaches us forgiveness your family will wrong you your friends will wrong you and i'm not talking only about your children and your family i'm talking about your friends will wrong you how many of you are seated here today who hasn't done ayaka with somebody Tell me the truth. If you have Ayaka today, when you being Kasa, Pija on Sana Menge. Obia and Pija. As you move, you will say, when you will be Aka. Wait, Menen and Kasa be on da. Copying your savior here. The way our Father in heaven forgives us, and the parable that Jesus spoke about forgiveness we must have that same forgiveness in our hearts and so if we are true christians we must learn to forgive and forget we must learn to forgive and forget and so that is the lesson the next one that i like very much today i had to go and join the muslims for their prayers, their salah prayers before coming to perform my own task in my house, the house of God. <laughs> there are a few tunes I like. I like, um, let's, let's sing this one. Um, great things he has done, yeah? So unto the Lord be the glory, great things he has done.
Action. 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 Now, 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 now. Thank you very much. Uh, today is Men's Ministry Day, and it's also Father's Day. We have arranged it such that we celebrate our Men's Ministry Day on Father's Day. And so I wish all the responsible fathers. <laughs> All the rest. I qualified it. <laughs> there are people who are good at being fathers by creating children to be fathers. But it's not every father who is a responsible father. So I said today we celebrate all responsible fathers in this church and all responsible fathers in Ghana. Because it's not easy to be a father. It's not easy to wake up in the morning and Auntie Lodina says, where is the chop money? <laughs> to put food on the table for your children, it's not easy to pay the rent. When the landlord is coming, you won't be the father who will go and hide under the bed. May God bless you all so that you won't have to hide under your bed when your landlord is coming. <laughs> You'll be the father who would promptly pay your child's school fees and make sure that they go to school. May God bless all of us so that we'll be able to do that. You'll be the father who will pay the bills, water bill, electricity bill, and you go and bring somebody to come and do illegal connection in your house. <laughs> May God grant all of us divine replenishment to be able to do so as our president said this is not the first time i've stood behind this pulpit any time you walk and you see somebody wearing that clerical color stand at attention and salute him because it's not easy i assure you even as i'm talking now my stomach is doing me <laughs> Because you can be the best orator, you can be the best speaker, and anti one of the best speakers. I've addressed hundreds of thousands of people before on subjects from archaeology to zoology, and yet it is never the same. You can talk about anything, you can talk about agriculture, you can talk about economy. But when it comes to talking about the word of God, it is a completely different ball game. You need divine utterance. The first time I came and stood here, Kweji was our head pastor. And when he was getting to the day, I was wondering what sermon would I preach? And most of you remember that experience I had. I went to Kweji and asked him, I said, well, Kweji, I need help. This sermon, I don't know how I'm going to go about it. I remember the advice he gave me. He said, take your Bible and open it to any page <laughs> and that when you open it read whatever is there and that the holy spirit will speak to you so i went home and took Kweji's advice i opened the bible i think he went to jeremiah that time and i read and the holy spirit didn't speak to me <laughs> So I said, maybe Jeremiah is not the one. Let me open again. <laughs> and I opened again, it went to Ezekiel. Still no Holy Spirit. So that day I came and stood there. I remember I preached something. I don't remember what it was I preached. But all of you very politely when I finished, oh, preacher man, great sermon, great sermon. <laughs> I myself, I knew what I came and spoke here was rubbish. <laughs> And so I prayed for divine utterance. I said, God, speak to me and give me divine utterance. And so there was a second time I remember, and that one, I took the topic of uh, favor, God's favor, when God's favor is on you. And um, I drew mostly from the book of Esther, about the story of Esther and Mordecai. I remember that sermon. And so I had moved to the next level, small. So today, 
I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. Yeah. About when I was informed that I'll be the preacher on today's men's ministry day. About two weeks before the date, until Lordina came to me. So, have you done your sermon? I said, oh, the Holy Spirit hasn't descended on me yet. She said, get away, what Holy Spirit? Go ahead, sit down and write the sermon and stop this nonsense. <laughs> so, today we are here, and as you know, our theme is Send the Light for Growth and Expansion. It was a well-chosen theme by our Executive Presbytery, and that is our theme for the year, and that we should take God's word to all corners of the earth. Indeed, the Bible enjoins us to send God's word to every corner of the, world, uh, of the earth. And in Matthew 24, verse 14, it says that, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. It means that before the judgment, before Christ returns for the judgment, the word of God must have gone to all nations, to every corner of the world. And so when our executive presbytery says, send the light, it is just asking us to fulfill our Christian responsibility of sending God's word to all corners of the earth. And the way we can do this is by evangelization. It means that we must go out and talk to people about the word of God. Our Christian brothers and sisters do this and go from door to door delivering Christian religious tracts and speaking to people about the word of God. It is not only them who should do that. All of us have a duty to do that. Even within your neighborhood, if once a while you go sit with your neighbors and preach the word of God to them, and that's why you also must study the word of God. That's why Bible studies is very important. Because you must understand the word of God to be able to explain it to somebody else. And so we all must be responsible for that. It's not only our pastors who must go preaching the word of God. All of us must be involved in this enterprise. Now, as young children, we attended Bible school, and in our uh, school curriculum, we had Bible studies, and so we learned a lot of things about the Bible. Our children are in the children's service there, learning the Bible. And for me, one of the most important things in the Bible that has contributed to my understanding of God's word has been the stories Jesus told. These stories are called parables. And so, if you look at the African culture, we also have small stories that transfer our value systems to our children. And so when we're young, our mothers and fathers told us Anansi's stories. And always, Anansi will come up to some scheme and eventually the story will end with him suffering for it to show that don't be greedy, don't be selfish, don't be what, what, what. Aside from that, our elders say to a person who is intelligent, you speak in Proverbs. And so Proverbs, parables, Anansi stories, all those things are meant to convey a message. But Jesus particularly use short stories called parables and you had to think through yourself to understand what he was saying and so he used parables to impart the gospel and most of these parables can be found in matthew mark and luke indeed those are some of the most important books in the bible indeed they are my favorite books because they chronicle the life of jesus and if you're a christian you want to live a christian-like life and to live a Christian-like life, it means that you are walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And so those three books must be books that you read because they chronicle his life and what he did in his lifetime. 
And so most of these parables will be found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so the disciples one day asked him, he said, Ah, by you cry, why do you speak in parables? If you want to speak, just say the thing straight. You go and be logoligi, logoligi, like that. And his response was, and that is in Matthew 13, 13. This is the English Standard Version. He says, those seeing, they do not see. And those hearing, they do not hear or understand. And so, you must think through the parable to get the story. And these stories are timeless stories that teach us about the kingdom of God. And today, today on Father's Day, there are few of those parables that I've selected that I want to through because they relate to relationships and to fatherhood. And the most important one is the parable Jesus told about the prodigal son. And that parable is in Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. You all remember that story of the young man, two brothers, the father had two children. The younger brother went up to the father one day and said, divide your property and give me my share and let me go and start my life. I said, Papa, Japa dia odi atu hoa mai eno, odi echimu miensa, na fa me dia mami, na me nkombo me bra. Very unusual request. I mean, if you're a father and your son comes and says, you're not dead, oh. He said, oh, share the property and give me my share. Me, I want to go and, you know, start my life. This was a very tolerant father. And so they say he gave the share of this son to him. And the son left the town and went to a city far away where they have the good life. And he really went and had a good life. He was all over with women, you know, doing all the things that, you know, uh, the, the city uh, has to offer. And he spent all his father's money. And when he spent it, they say that he had no more money. He was finding it difficult to feed. Eventually, he went and found work where? In a pig sty. A farmer who was raising pigs hired him as the keeper of the pigs. And sometimes, he even felt so hungry that he envied the food that the pigs were being given. And sometimes he felt like eating that food. So that's the first character in the story. We talked about the father. The father tolerantly gave his share to him. Then the son went and spent all and fell into um, a, a lot of uh, trouble. So what did he do? He said, I will go back to my father and that even if he will employ me as one of his servants I would be better off than where I am here so then the son gathered courage and so that's the next thing courage how to gather courage when you've done wrong when you've sinned when you've done somebody wrong to gather courage to be able to say look I'll go back and reclaim and restore what I had before. And so this son gathered courage and he went to his father. And as you remember, he said, Father, I have sinned against you and I have sinned against, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you and that I am not worthy to be your son. He himself knew that what he had done was abominable. And so he thought that his father would be angry and so he said, I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. And what was he going to beg for? He was going to beg for his father to employ him as a servant, no longer as a son. And one of the sheep wandered off. And so in the evening when he was taking the sheep back home, he counted and there were 99. He counted again 99. So he realized that one was missing what did he do 
he left the 99 and he went roaming and looking for the one that was missing and he went and when he found the single sheep that was missing they say he rejoiced he had 99 he left them and went to look for that one and when he found that one he rejoiced because he found one missing sheep and so it holds lessons for us too we have children we have family we must never give up on any of them there are many times you have family you have siblings you have friends and it's like oh wait the moonjan and life for mano it means that you have all left the person to whatever he is that missing sheep or she is that missing sheep you must never ever say oh wait the moonjan and life for mano we be can ask them they be ever can ask them we will go and look for that one sheep and find it and bring it back home and so it's important that we live as family and as fathers it is our responsibility as the leaders of the house and the shepherd of the flock to look for that one sheep that is missing in this church our shepherd is also Tete, and that is why when he hasn't seen you in church for a while he leaves all the rest and comes to look for you and so when he hasn't seen me for a while he sends a text excellency are you okay i say also i'm fine <laughs> the next one he doesn't see me again i get a phone call excellency are you coming to church today i say also today i'm in town i'm coming <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so that's the second one. The next, which is my favorite, I like that the best, is the parable of the sower. I've told that several times. And that is found in Luke 8, verse 5 to 15. My father was a farmer, so I grew up on the farm. And he used to have a rice farm. During vacations, he would bundle all of us to go and live on the farm and we will work with the laborers on the farm tractor operators we learned how to drive tractors and how to plow the field and so i know how to drive a tractor and plow the field and all that i learned that skill maybe if i wasn't president i'll be a tractor operator on some farm uh, if i was in a former president i'll be a tractor operator on some farm up in the north and so when we have plowed the field in those days we didn't use planters and so we used to hire people from the village uh, we used to call it by day by day so they'll come and join us and then we'll be walking and throwing the seed the rice seed and so because i lived it this particular parable has a lot of meaning for me because jesus said the sower was sowing his seed so it means he was throwing the seed and he said some of the seed fell on the wayside and the wayside is a path where people walk and so people and horses and donkeys walking trampled on the seed that fell by the wayside and he said some of the seed fell on rocks and you know rocks are hard and so the seed is not able to penetrate with its roots and once it plant cannot put its roots in the ground what happens to it it withers and it dies and he said some fell amongst thorns and the thorns choked the plants and then he said the fourth category some fell on fertile soil and they bore fruits they grew and bore fruits and so this is a particularly important parable for us those that fell by the wayside it meant that they hear the word of god but as soon as they've heard it the devil comes and pulls them back into where they were before 
Then there are those who fell on rocks. They hear the word of God and they rejoice and are happy. And for a moment, they become faithful followers of Christ. But it's normally temporary because the plant cannot put its roots into the rock. The devil comes again and the word of God leaves their minds. And then there are those who germinate and start growing. But when they start growing, the weeds choke them. And so these are those who hear the word of God. They accept it, they are happy, they rejoice in it. But the weeds are the worldly cares, the cares of the world, riches, material things. Those that love for material things and uh, uh, things of the world quickly choke them and take the word of God out of their hearts. And then there are those for whom the seed falls on fertile soil. And I believe that in Ringway Gospel Center, the seed is falling on fertile soil. We have grown from strength to strength. For those of us who came, and I call us Latter-day Saints, Masupe and all of them were the pioneers of this church. And they'll tell you where they began from. They began from some small school in Osu. Today, to the glory of God, look at where we're sitting. This church has grown because that seed fell on fertile soil. And so we used to, we, we wish to use today to thank the founding fathers of this church for how far you have brought us. Today, we are family. I walked through the gates of this church almost 23 years ago. And I have never regretted and I have never turned back. I want to thank all of you for the support and encouragement that you have given me since I entered this church, especially Auntie Lodina, who is at the back there somewhere. Nyamishra wo Mama Lodina. And then you have the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that is one of the most famous of Jesus' parables. Everybody knows the Good Samaritan. And that is because somebody who was traveling somewhere was attacked by armed robbers and he was injured and left to die. You say, what happened? A priest came passing by. A priest, Osofo, came passing by. And he saw the man and he said, uh huh. I'm in a hurry, I can't stay to attend to this person. He walked and passed. And then a Levite came passing by and also saw the man. And he said, no, 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 I won't uh, 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 deal with this. And he passed. Now the person who stopped to assist this man was who we call a Samaritan. The Samaritans were like outcasts. They were third servant ah the gold i gave you where is it it was only one bag of gold the one who is a bit hard working but also doing well he gave two talents and then the lazy one he gave one talent because they said he gave each according to his ability so it means that the, the master knew the servants and what their abilities were so Servant go, uh, master goes and spends three months and then he comes back and calls his servants. Hey, you have come, uh, master. Wah, wah, too. Then he sits down and says, You a drunk on taboo. Obiam beka nia sikana me de bang mono Then the first servant comes and he's carrying bags of talents, talents, let's say gold, bags of gold. And so he puts it down, and then he puts five in front of the master and says, Master, the five bags of gold you gave me, here they are. And I invested it. And the five bags of gold, when I invested it, I got another five bags of gold. So now you have ten bags of gold. 
And the master clapped and said, oh, you are such a good servant. Come, come and sit with me. You know, I, I mean, you're part of me. I'm happy with you and uh, uh, God will bless you. And the second one too came with two talents. And said, Master, here are two talents you gave me. I invested it and I got another two talents. So now you have four talents. And he congratulated this one too. He praised him, he blessed him. And then the last one, the Aquajuro one, who got one talent. You know what he did? When the master left, he said, oh, this is my master. He's a very difficult man. I know him. Let me go and dig a hole and bury the gold in the ground. When he comes, I'll remove his thing and give to him. Boko, I don't want trouble. Sapa pay. So, third servant. Ah, the gold I gave you, where is it? It was only one bag of gold. He said, Master, you gave me one bag of gold. And you've come back here, it's your one bag of gold. I know how you are. And the master was furious. And what did he do? He said they should cast him out into the night. And so, it has lessons uh, for us. That Jesus is telling us not to bury our talents, but to invest it. The word of God asks us to pray unceasingly. But it doesn't say bury your talents and wait for salvation. It says that whatever talent God has given you, invest it profitably so that you can double it. Don't hide that talent and sit down and say, Oh, Jesus Christ is coming back. I'm waiting. And then you sit on your knees and pray and you're in your room. You will come back with that one talent when Jesus comes. You will have only one talent. He's giving all of us talents. He's giving all of us the grace that we have to invest and multiply. And so these parables have, you know, a lot of significance for us. And we have others, the parable of the master seed, a small seed. It's one of the smallest seeds you can find. And yet when you plant it, it grows into a huge tree. And so each of your children is a master seed. A house today. <laughs> MP for Ningo Pram Pram. And so many of my uh, colleagues in the back there, I want to thank all of you for joining me. And uh, to thank especially my head pastor, Sofu Tete, for taking me as a brother and uh, looking after my back. I want to thank the president of our men's ministry for the good work he's doing. And indeed to thank the men's ministry for um, the work that they do, especially the project team, uh, Mr. Edi Ankama, Fred, and uh, uh, my in-law, Wafake, and all the others. I want to thank you for the good work that you have been doing for this church. May our church continue to grow bountifully and be that huge master tree that we all want it to be. May our church not be the National Cathedral Hall. Let <laughs> you didn't see that one coming. May our church never be the National Cathedral Hall. Let it grow and grow and grow.